Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Talk and Tour Career Series. I'm Krista Harmon. I'm with the Kent Intermediate School District's Career Readiness Department. And I'm thrilled to partner with Mary Freebed today for this Talk and Tour. They have been such a great partner um, with our programming, and I'm looking forward to meeting some of the professionals that are here today. So I'd like um, my panelists to go around and introduce themselves. And I'll start with you, Elizabeth. Why don't you guys share your name, um, your job title, and how long you've been with Mary Freebed. So go ahead, Elizabeth, and I'll queue up David next. Um, I'm Lizbeth Brenneman. I'm a speech pathologist at Mary Freebed um, in the inpatient rehab. I'm on the brain injury team. Um, I've been at Mary Freebed for five years now. Awesome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank David, you for and having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, my name is Dave DePrado. I am a physical therapist and I've been working for Mary Freebed now for 10 years. Terrific. Christy? I can't hear you, Christy, but it looks like you're not muted either. There we go. There we Sorry go. about that. Okay. So um, I've been here at Mary Freebed for 26 years. Um, my first 18 years, I was in inpatient pediatrics. Um, and ever since then, I've been here at Wheelchair and Adaptive Sports. Um, so happy to be here. Great. And how about you, Marcus? Good afternoon. I'm Marcus. And uh, you can see my title there. Um, I've served in a, a variety of capacities at Mary Freebed. I'm coming up on 10 years at Freebed. I started as a human resources intern, and now I support supply chain, purchasing, and uh, also the CEO of Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, which is a subsidiary, independent subsidiary of Mary Freebed. Happy Good. to be here. Yeah, we look forward to digging into some of those different roles. You have probably the longest title I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and how about you, Zach, last but not least? Um, an orthotics and prosthetics resident, um, and I've been with Mary Freebed for roughly six months, so I'm pretty pretty new to Mary Freebed. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. And I know the students will especially like to hear, um, you know, some of you that are right out of college. They want to know some of those transitions. So to get us started, I'd love for you guys to take us back to high school. You know, is this where you thought you'd be? Help these young people and um, educators that might be on the call, parents, kind of how you got started. So we'll start with you, um, Elizabeth. Is this what you thought you'd do back in high school? Um, yes and no. I knew that I wanted to help people in some capacity. Um, I was going kind of back and forth between, you know, education and the medical field. Um, ultimately, um, I started working. Um, I got, I was lucky enough to get a, a job at a brain injury rehab facility in like a adult foster care home. And that is ultimately how I got exposed to the speech and language pathology field. Um, but that was actually while I was going to school at Michigan State. Yeah, you didn't have it all figured out when you went. No, absolutely not. <laughs> and we'll definitely like to hear more of those. Um, what kind of impacted your decision? Okay. Um, David, how about you? What were you thinking back in high school? Yeah, actually, um, I, I'm fairly similar to Elizabeth. Actually, I started out, I actually wanted to be a teacher. Uh, I think part of that was because teaching was one of the only professions I really had much exposure to. Um, and so I started on the teaching career path uh, in my senior year in high school and then going into college. And actually just my, my mom thought I um, would be a good fit as a physical therapist. So I took my first physiology class and um, enjoyed a lot and the rest is history. So that was later in your college that you took that class? Uh, actually, pr fairly early on. It was like uh, sophomore year, um, so it was a year into it. Yeah, that's been helpful for young people to know they don't have to have it all figured out, that there can be some input that happens to us that helps us figure it out. What about you, Christy? Did you always think rec therapy when you were back in high school? Oh, but unfortunately, you're muted still, Christy. And if you if you have a quiet environment, you can, if if you have a quiet environment, you're welcome to keep your mics on the panel. Okay. So sorry about that. I, I no think, problem. Uh, okay. 
So I didn't even know recreational therapy existed when I was in high school. Um, I was interested in being an elementary education teacher. I loved working with kids. I had a lot of experience um, working in the pool and lifeguarding and um, with WSI and things like that. Um, and it wasn't until I kind of moved through different experiences in college and um, came to learn about recreational therapy that I signed that major and went that direction. Yeah, and I know that uh, a lot of young people aren't familiar with that either. So I'm looking forward to you sharing more about that. How about yeah. you, Marcus, when you were back in high school, did you think you'd be in charge of supply chain? A lot of young high schoolers don't know what that is. Um, absolutely not. Uh, so first of all, congrats to all the students who are taking initiative to even be thinking this far ahead. Uh, in high school, I thought I wanted to be a stockbroker. Uh, I loved math. I loved numbers. And, you know, I only saw what you saw on TV, the fast-paced energy of people running around making deals. So I guess in a way, you know, looking back, I, there's some of those qualities that I use currently in supply chain and um, ultimately just trying to get the best price and the best quality, best product for our patients, our staff, supporting the organization. Um, but I gave in to peer pressure. Because everyone I talked to when I said I wanted to be a stock broker, they said, no, you're so good working with people. You need to work with people. Um, and so I ultimately uh, actually started in human resources, and I don't regret that at all, um, getting to interact with people and not being behind a desk just looking at numbers all day. Um, so, no, I had no clue, and uh, that's okay. But it is interesting, you know, how other people have influences on us. And I'm definitely going to come back to the panelists to find out who had an influence on you because young people, um, there's so many things, like I said, that kind of twist and turn our journey. So we definitely want to hear more about that. Um, Zach, what were you thinking? It's not too long ago. You're a pretty young guy. What were you thinking in high school? Um, I'm a bit of a unique case because from a really young age, I knew I wanted to get into orthotics and prosthetics because um, due to some nerve damage um, that I've been exposed to. Um, I've worn orthotics since I was a young kid, worn leg braces. Um, so I knew I wanted to help people that were in a similar situation. And I kind of decided at a young age that I wanted to do this and help people just like me. So yeah, and that's great. You know, those there, there are certainly those are reasons we pick our careers. We have personal experience. I know physical therapy is a big one that if, they, if the athletes gone through physical therapy. So your role model, because probably people that you worked with were inspiring to you. So tell us about some of those people um, that you met back then. Um, my orthotist uh, was a big role model back when I was growing up because without him, I couldn't have played baseball and football like I did in middle school and high school. Um, so just seeing the impact that they he could have on my life um, made me want to um, have that impact on somebody and allow them to reach their goals and do whatever they want to do. Yeah, that's very inspiring. I love um, that we have that capacity to inspire other people. What about you, Marcus, as you, you know, thinking you want to be a stockbroker, but then you changed your mind? Like, what were some of those influences on you that were both positive and negative that kind of shifted you? Sure. Um, you know, it was really just uh, picking a good school that was uh, close enough to home where I could um, you get exposure to a bunch of different types of opportunities. And so that's uh, ultimately what made that decision. And then the courses and, and the friends that I made there. So not, not any one particular person um, other than just the common consensus of, oh, no, you should pursue, you know, working with people and business, people, human resources, that's where it kind of all um, married together. Awesome, and that's uh, also a field that a lot of young people aren't aware of. So again, students, if you're, we're gonna dig more into it with Marcus, but human resources, because um, sometimes young people, you know, they think they're gonna go clinical, but then life circumstances or they learn something new and they end up in the more the business side of Mary Free Bed. And that's why we're so glad you're here, Marcus, because you're still part of an amazing organization and get to help people. Um, Christy, what kind of made you think about rec therapy? What were some of those influences for you? Yeah, I, um, it actually started out with my college roommate. She was in the rec therapy profession and or um, major, and she kept coming back and talking about what they were learning in their classes and the disabilities they were learning about and the activities and, and things like that. And so I went and met with a counselor, and the more the counselor talked to me, the more it was like all of my life experiences were heading me in this direction all along um, between 
growing up in camps and doing babysitting and working with kids and Special Olympics and you know just just all the all the things that I had had experiences with leading up to that it was all culminating with this is what I was supposed to do so it was kind of cool. I think that's such a great insight um, for young people on this um, event, you know, be looking at what you're already naturally interested in, what you're already naturally doing, those are clues. So pay attention. So yes, I love that you found a career that kind of encompassed your natural values, your experiences at that point, um, that you like working with kids, that's fantastic. Um, how about you, David? What were some of those influences for you to pick PT? Uh, yeah, um, I would act, definitely say um, a, well, a family that I kind of grew up uh, with, and they had kids that were about my age. Um, the, the father of that family was, was an orthopedic surgeon and he had worked his way through, um, he grew up having dyslexia and a lot of like, um, uh, struggles within school that he had to fight through. And he started out his career as a physical therapist. Um, and I had always admired him and he allowed me to get in and, and come into the OR with him when he, as he had been a surgeon for several years, um, and just kind of experiencing and seeing seeing what he had done, and then um, also kind of talking with him about um, some specifics about okay, what what do we do with these people after they've had surgery, um, and what kind of issues do they go through, and and how did he originally start out helping them, but then moved into um, orthopedic surgery, just kind of opens the picture up and kind of not only exposes you to more options. Um, for both career path, but just kind of get an idea of what what happens to people within a um, the healthcare setting. And I, I just think that's so important too that you had an adult who kind of was willing and and wanted to give you information, um, welcomed you in for job shadows. Um, I love that that influence. You know, having those conversations about what his job was like, and like you say, the pre and post his pre surgery role. Um, Talking to adult young people, it's so, so important. That's how you're gonna glean information, just like what we're doing right now, that there's probably people in your life too that you could talk to about their careers. So don't underestimate those conversations and the influence. How about you, Elizabeth, when you were thinking about those influences for you and deciding where you landed? Um, honestly, there were kind of multiple things that just kind of came together for me. Um, I actually did not pick my major until junior year of college. Um, I was very back and forth on what I had, you know, wanted to pursue. Um, and one of those factors was that job that I had mentioned before, where I got to interact with people with, with traumatic brain injuries. Um, and I had some responsibilities as part of our job description, tracking certain behaviors and social pragmatics and things. Um, so that's kind of what exposed me to the speech pathology field. And then weirdly at the same time, um, I actually had, I, you know, I grew up, my, my childhood home was part of a cul-de-sac and the two other, um, girls that, you know, were my neighbors, I had found out that they had actually gone into speech pathology as well. Um, so it was kind of one of these things where it was, it just seemed meant to be. And honestly, I just kind of put all my eggs in one basket and it, it worked out really well. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, there's actually um, a theory of career development called the chaos theory. And it, it talks about, you know, those, those things that happen in life that kind of start to point us. It's not something we can figure out necessarily um, by the book, that there's not one way that we find these careers. And that's what I find so fascinating about this field in general. Um, so because some of you guys um, have jobs that young people on the talking to her may not know about. Let's take it from the top and I'd like you to share what what your responsibilities are. What is your job? And maybe share where you are too because it's great about this virtual format that some of you um, are outside of the Grand Rapids area. So as you talk, share what location you're in. But let's start with you, Elizabeth, and we'll work our way back down the list. Um, what it really means to be a speech um, pathologist. What is that like? Um, well, the, the scope of practice is actually quite large for a speech pathologist. And I think when most people think of a speech therapist, they think of like a school type setting. Um, so, uh, you know, they don't really get to see the medical side of things typically. Um, but I'm in the inpatient rehab hospital in, in Grand Rapids. Um, like I said, I'm on the brain injury team. So I get to evaluate and treat um, patients with traumatic brain injuries. 
Um, most of the time we're looking at things like swallowing. So sometimes after someone has had a brain injury, they're no longer able to swallow um, and we may need to put them on modified diets and things like that. Um, and then we also look at speech and language, obviously. Um, you know, we have some patients who aren't able to verbally express you know, themselves or um, they may have a difficult time comprehending. So we work on that. And then we also work on um, thinking type skills as well. So things like memory, attention, problem solving. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. And again, young people, if this sounds even remotely, you know, interesting, this is where you get to go out to the career websites after this and dig in a little further. But I think that's what I've learned about speech too, is that it could be a, a person that has cancer in a throat. Um, it could be exactly. a baby who isn't, you know, sucking properly. So it's like you say, the scope of practice, work with little kids, different settings. I mean, we're going to come back to hear about your favorite part, but that definitely gives um, young people the big picture. David, what about you? Um, with physical therapy, even versus occupational therapy, because we don't have an occupational therapist today, and sometimes young people are kind of deciding between those two. So tell us more about yours than maybe a little OT. Yeah, totally. Um, well, I'm specifically in sports rehabilitation. Um, I've actually um, always loved sports. It's always been kind of my thing in all sorts of different sports, playing them. But then um, I had always hoped to get into um, treating athletes and seeing athletes in, in particular. So um, I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, work with Mary Freebed uh, for the last 10 years for that. But um, yeah, in physical therapy, we, we definitely, uh, we cover the whole body uh, really in schooling and then in treatment, we can cover the whole body. Um, and um, typically we're, we're looking at issues related to movement. You know, when someone comes in with some sort of pain uh, and it seems to be because of their muscles or their joints or their you know, bones or something not working quite right, that's where we're coming in to figure out where the movement dysfunction is coming from. Um, and actually occupational therapists are, are pretty similar to that. And I would say that occupational therapists are going to focus uh, a fair bit more on the functional activities of like eating, bathing, dressing, cleaning, um, cooking, things like that. Um, there are activities that you need to do, be able to do to be independent uh, at home um, and, and take care of yourself. So, um, and then the physical therapy side of things is just um, kind of in conjunction with that, that function of um, getting back to running, walking, um, performing, performing your sport um, and any other kind of aspect of, uh, similar to that. And again, physical therapists, there's all sorts of environments that you can work as well. You're working specifically with athletes um, yeah. and you're located at the Mary Freebed Y. On yes. The, on yep. Grand Rapids. Yeah, I think that's what's exciting for young people. And I want them to understand is that some of these are umbrella terms for these occupations and then you can start to specialize. And so we'll, and so it sounds like with athletes. So Christy, when you talk about rec therapy, again, you didn't know what it was in high school um, and a lot of young people don't either. Help us understand the difference of what you do from some of your colleagues. Right, yeah, recreational therapy is really, um, I consider it kind of a team sport for sure. Um, we definitely couldn't do what we did do with our patients without our colleagues um, in PT, OT, speech. Um, you know, if, if the physical therapist isn't helping get their legs stronger, you know, we can't help them swim better in the pool. Um, you know, using their legs or, you know, if they're not teaching them how to transfer from their bed to their wheelchair, you know, it's, it's harder for us to teach the transfer from their wheelchair into a hand cycle to be able to ride an adapted bike. Um, you know, same with speech therapy and our in, helping them with independence into the community and communicating their order at a restaurant, for, for example, you know, things like that. So, you know, I, I like to, ex, to kind of explain, especially in the clinical inpatient um, setting that rec recreational therapy puts together everything that these kids and adults have been working on in their therapies into the real world. So into the community, um, back onto the court, you know, um, back into their sport, back into their school, you know, things like that. So um, when I worked in patient pediatrics, it was really fun because I could, you know, say, okay, we're gonna work on, you know, getting your legs stronger. We're gonna work on scanning your environment safely. Um, and we're going to get you on an adapted bike and we're going to ride out in the community. 
Um, and so they're kind of putting together a whole bunch of goals, but to a kid, they just know they're riding a bike and they're having fun. Um, and you can kind of come in the back door like that because um, they're just having fun or we're gonna ride with your siblings. So now their siblings are included in therapy and they're having fun and you know, things like that. Um, in my current role, I'm in, and both of these roles have been in the Grand Rapids campus here at Mary Freebed. Um, in my current role, I'm in wheelchair and adaptive sport. So I'm working with um, kids and adults and getting them into sport at whatever level they're at. So classes and clinics. So I do like a scuba diving clinic or I might have someone come in who has autism or someone that comes in who has cerebral palsy or someone that comes in with a spinal cord injury. And I'm, I'm you know, adapting that event to you know, um, how they can do that event. So if someone with a spinal cord injury that doesn't have any use of their legs, they don't need fins for scuba clinic. Um, they're just propelling themselves through the water with their arms only. So teaching them how to do that activity successfully. Um, or I might be having um, them participate in a wheelchair sports team. So someone who has a physical disability is unable to play basketball um, at an ambulatory or stand-up level. Um, they're using a wheelchair for sport and um, competing very um, at a very high level across the U.S. So kind of a wide variety of things that I get to do. And so again, after someone's had maybe an injury where they lost function or you get to bring the fun back, get them back Absolutely. to the fun. I heard that some of you rec therapy folks even get to bring people to concerts and fun things like yep. that. <laughs> yep, yep. It's all about whatever they need to feel comfortable and know how to get back to the things that they love to do. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Marcus, when you think about your role in this big picture um, of making Mary Free Bad role, how do you contribute? What's your job like? Uh, ultimately, supporting the clinicians and supporting the patients. Um, without, you know, the great work that Dave, Zach, you know, Elizabeth, Christy, you know, others are doing, um, there'd be no need for supply chain. You know, ultimately, um, just trying to find and uh, creative solutions to the problems that come up and meeting the needs of others. So specific to supply chain, I mean, you can look this up, but there's three main components. It's sourcing, um, which is identifying the right products, procurement, which is actually purchasing those, and then the logistics of getting those items. Um, and the days, uh, the needs vary daily. Um, and they vary monthly. Uh, you know, we had a lot of supply chain concerns. I think the world is now with COVID-19. And so, you know, I supported my team and making sure that we could secure all the equipment, the PPE, the items we needed to keep patients and staff safe. Um, but you asked me that question, you know, eight months ago, and it was more focusing on, okay, we need this additional furniture because these departments are moving and relocating. So just finding those solutions um, to meet the needs of the clinicians and the patients. Um, you know, it's routine supplies like gauze and, you know, TheraBand and uh, things that the clinicians need in order to, to treat patients, provide exceptional care. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to operations, and that's kind of where uh, I support with Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. It's a small nonprofit um, where individuals work with those who are blind or have low vision, um, and so what I'll do is I'll, I might spend some time working directly with the social worker and uh, bouncing some ideas on how we can uh, modify our support groups so that we can keep people safe um, and just bounce ideas off. Like, yes, let's make sure we can still engage our clients, keep them safe, and, and just, um, you know, overcome any potential barriers or concerns that there are. Um, you know, I spend some time meeting with donors or potential community organizations or community partners like disability advocates and area agency on aging um, in, in ways that we can advocate for the blind and visually impaired. Um, so the needs vary daily. Uh, today, I was reviewing some quotes for some furniture for Lansing um, and, you know, meeting the, uh, the office staff's needs, but making sure that we didn't, you know, spend so much money that we could have purchased a car instead um, when we're talking about three cubicles. So uh, vendor relations is another large part of that, um, but ultimately uh, supporting my team and, and, uh, and helping so that my team can support either the clients that they directly treat or the uh, staff and departments that they typically purchase for. So you really are the glue, Marcus. You're making that place run. Because like you said, without you, they couldn't do their jobs. And I just love the different parts you were sharing about your job and how that people person that so many people affirmed you early in your life that those are those skill sets are coming to play for sure. 
I still get to play with the numbers too, though. So uh, that, yes, that that's little right. stockbroker tinge, uh, it, it works, um, and, and it, it's, it's quite fulfilling. That's a beautiful thing when, you know, you don't know what you don't know back then and how you could see these different parts come together, just like um, Christy was saying with her early experiences. I just love that about career development. So Zach, a lot of young people may not know what an orthodox prosthesis is. You mentioned a little bit at the beginning about your own um, nerve damage. So tell us what your, your daily work is like. So orthotics and prosthetics encompasses a lot of things. Um, I got some props here. Anywhere from like just a simple shoe insert. Um, this is an orthotic. Um, a cervical collar for someone that broke their neck. This is an orthotic or a leg brace um, to support someone's ankles and uh, feet. Uh, that all is under the umbrella of orthotics. And prosthetics, um, I have a leg right here. Um, with, uh, this is for someone that uh, had an amputation of above the knee. So they, um, their leg was, um, had to be uh, taken off surgically and, um, or uh, we have patients that have, um, were born without a limb. So we have to work with their needs and um, really understand their goals for um, their ambulation or positioning or uh, stabilization. I work, I'm in the Muskegon office, so I'm not in the main hospital. Um, so I work in uh, uh, emergency rooms, um, inpatient hospitals, uh, and um, we work with uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, and it's a team. We, we all communicate with each other to figure out the patient goals and what's best for the patient. And we come up with a game plan and um, sometimes they need a device and uh, orthosis or a prosthesis um, from myself and just to help them regain their mobility and um, uh, accomplish their goals. So that's... Now, are you in the hospitals because you're a resident, because you're still in training? Is that why you're in that setting versus like the main Mary Freebad building? No, um, we work with, today I did a custom um, KFO, which is a knee ankle foot orthosis. Um, which goes from the foot all the way up to past the knee joint. Um, and it's a brace kind of like this one, but it goes up past the knee to help stabilize. So um, we, had, we had to take um, a bunch of measurements of the patient and uh, to make sure it fit and we fabricated it, um, which is another cool part of my field is it, we get to get our hands dirty too. So we go from, we have the patient and then to, we take a mold of them with the same material if you were to break your arm. So we have an exact model or replica of the pa uh, patient's leg. And then we um, pull plastic or bend metal. Um, so it's really a hands-on field as well. So um, if you like tinkering, I like tinkering with things and building things and, um, helping people. So orthotics and prosthetics is a good um, mesh of hands-on skills and um, patient care. So that's kind of why I got into this field as well. Yeah, I think that's what I've heard about your field is it is for those people who like hands-on because you're really constructing some of that from, from scratch. Um, also with some of the like, like the technology that's coming into your field, um, more robotics. Um, tell us about some of that end of your field right now. So um, that's kind of the really cool side of my field and the prosthetic side. Um, so if someone were to have their hand um, cut off um, due to many different reasons, they can actually control this robotic hand um, through other muscle contractions. So if they wanted to close their hand, we can program the hand or the elbow to move um, with the contraction or the flexion of another muscle that is intact. So um, it's really cool to um, 
be able to implement someone's um, things that they can do and um, give back what they what they can't do or what was taken from them. Absolutely, like you said, with your own um, ortho orthotist prosthetist, with you being able to play sports in high school. So mm -hmm. again, for young people on the call or educators, you know, O and P. That's kind of the lingo, right? And O and P. Yeah. Um, if you Google that, you know, to start to research about this field. I'm going to take you guys, though, because I do want to spend a little bit of time on education, you know, what it takes to get to these fields. Um, I guess I'd really like to, you know, tell us what kind of degree you need, but also, as you give your answer, focus in on what some of those key education components were for you. Like, did you have a certain internship that was really valuable? Was it a connection you had made with um, certain your professors that helped you find out about opportunities? So kind of what were those key pieces about your own education? That made a difference. So we can start with you, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, and we'll work our way back down. But tell us about your education and what it takes to become a speech path. Um, so I went to Michigan State. Um, in order to become a speech path, you need um, to major in, well, I majored in communicative sciences and disorders. Um, and then you also need to get your master's. So I also got my master's degree at Michigan State. Again, same degree, um, communicative sciences and disorders. Um, you do need to take, um, before you get your C's, we call it, is when you're official, um, you have to take a, a praxis exam, um, and depending on your, your university, you usually have to take some form of like a comps exam as well. Um, what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry. No, just, no you're fine. As far as like, uh, young people really want to know how do you get from here to there? So were those, uh, were those an internship that help you make that transition? like from college even to the real world, like what were some of those key education components so, that? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so Michigan State program was a little bit different in that instead of having, a, you know, there are some universities that have an on-campus clinic. So they treat patients, you know, right, uh, you know, at the university. Um, Michigan State didn't have that. Um, so we actually got a little bit more on-site clinical experience. Um, in terms of with Mary Freebed, I actually had two internships here. Um, my first internship was an outpatient. And I, um, I mean, I, I fell in love with it right away. So as soon as, <laughs> as soon as I, um, you know, had the opportunity to give some requests for my next placement, I requested to come into inpatient. Um, I built some really great relationships with my supervisors, which was just key. Um, I mean, I still keep in touch with three out of my four supervisors that I had throughout my clinicals. Um, you know, right after I graduated, the, the field is pretty competitive. So Mary Freebed, you know, it's not like I could get right into Mary Freebed. So um, there is one year in between, um, you know, once you graduate and then before you get your C's, there's kind of this, this intermediate year called your, your CFY. Um, and for, for that year, I was at a subacute rehab. Um, and really, I, I was just very diligent about contacting HR. Sorry, Marcus. I was kind of, <laughs> I literally contacted HR like weekly to see if they were going to have any openings. Um, so, so that's kind of how I got to Mary Freebed. I don't know if I fully answered that question. Well, let me ask for just a little bit of um, defining. So what does CFY stand for and what are your C's? Help break that out for young people. Oh, so your C's are your clinical competency. Um, your CFY, oh my gosh, I feel like I should remember this. It's something clinical first year, maybe something okay. like that. Um, but yeah, it's the first year once you graduate, um, you know, you're, you're working, you're getting paid, um, typically not as much as, as once you earn your C's. Um, but technically you still have a supervisor that you can reach out to if you need anything. Um, and that's actually, that program is actually run by the American Speech Language um, and Hearing Association, ASHA, it's called, it kind of oversees our field. And that's a, you know, a program that, that is necessary in order to, to get your C's ultimately. That's great. And for um, anyone on the call or on this talking tour, you know, when those kind of tidbits, you know, ASHA, you know, Google it, find out what that association is all about, because it's going to give you some Absolutely. good information. So this is probably true for you too, David, um, and I'll let you address it, but that undergrad, it doesn't have to be in a certain 
thing, does it? It, it could be flexible. So tell us about what your undergrad is and maybe what some undergrads of even your colleagues to help young people understand that there's a little, there's a little wiggle room at the beginning as there are young people figuring this all out. Go ahead, David. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, for physical therapy, my undergrad degree was actually just in psychology. Um, honestly, because it was one of the easier degrees to get because I knew I was going to get eventually to physical therapy. Um, but you can get a degree in literally anything. I had um, a guy that I actually lived with in uh, PT school who had an English degree. Um, and I know a, a girl in a year before my class, uh, she had a Spanish degree. So you can literally get a degree in anything for your, for your undergraduate. Um, basically, you just have to graduate with that degree and then somewhere in your senior year, you're applying to physical therapy schools. Um, and that's um, become a lot easier than now than when it was uh, when I was applying. Um, so when I applied, I was barely able to apply to like three or four schools because it took so much time and so much effort. Um, now, a lot of students are able to, there's kind of an online system where you are filling out applications and some of your kind of baseline demographic information and um, submitting your grades and transcripts and everything, and then applying to like dozens of schools. Um, they do have that option now. So that's, that's kind of pretty nice actually. Um, but what happens is um, you do have to take prerequisite courses in your undergrad um, years that are going to kind of prepare you for physical therapy or occupational therapy. Um, they are specific courses like anatomy and physiology, uh, your first year of biology. I had to take uh, a full year of physics and a full year of chemistry, um, and then a few other psychology classes um, to then be able to actually apply to the PT school. And PT school is, is considered grad school, so graduate level. And right now, physical therapy, uh, um, you go straight from your undergrad to a doctoral program. So you're, you would be earning your doctorate degree. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that the occupational therapy, um, oh, their, their kind of um, national board is working on a doctoral program development for occupational therapy too. Um, but they're, they're at a master's level. Um, there's not really too much difference between the master and doctoral level. Um, just a couple classes and a couple requirements. Um, but, but ultimately, once you um, then apply to a PT school, um, if you're accepted, then you go to that school for three years. Um, and then once you complete all your um, courses, you'll take a, an exam, a board exam, and you have to pass that in order to get your license. That's really helpful to lay that out so that young people have an expectation of what it's gonna take. And I guess I wanna encourage um, young people that are on the call or, or guidance counselors, you know, I really recommend going to those PT schools that you're considering and really look at what the requirements are to get in so you can back that out. And like you say, be doing some of that undergrad work if there's a certain amount of contact hours you have to have to even apply, you know, what volunteer work could you be doing or sh shadowing or, you know, it's really important to look at the end goal and then just break it back down into steps so that by the time you get there, you have what you need. Is that correct, David? Anything you'd like to add to that? Exactly that. Yeah, I, I did about uh, like 200 hours of, of just observation in the clinic and then also some of the um, observation of my um, kind of godfather's in, in orthopedic surgery. Um, um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of hours of shadowing that just shows the school that you're, you're interested, you're, you're committing um, to, to physical therapy. And for young people on this call, you know, so many limitations because you're not 18 yet, but again, you can volunteer at a nursing home. You know, there are places that summer camps, you can start to get those hours early. So don't think you have to wait till a certain age to start to get those. So Christy, when you think about your education, um, was it a four-year degree? Anything that the young people should know about the process to get to be a rec therapist? Yes, yeah, it is it is a bachelor's degree, a four-year degree. Um, it took me five and a half years because I went through three different majors to find rec therapy, um, but I'm glad I did what I did. I would do it again the same way again. Um, 
I um, went to Central Michigan up in Mount Pleasant and you learn a wide variety of things for recreational therapy, not only um, about disabilities, but group, um, group planning, um, you know, how to lead activities, how to modify, how to evaluate and adapt so that, you know, everyone in your um, activity can participate independently, um, you know, things like that. Um, I did a psychology minor. Um, and so because I had a minor, I had a bachelor of science, um, I had one internship. And so I did my internship at South Bend at Memorial Hospital, and it was a uh, rehab floor within an acute care hospital. Um, and so that was really interesting. We had, um, I saw pediatrics, I saw adults, um, anywhere, any diagnosis. Um, and so that was really fun. And then I came right from there um, and was hired here at Mary Freebed um, as a brand new graduate. So um, I felt very fortunate to have a job when I walked for graduation because that was very rare that um, that that would happen. But you know, once you finish your internship and you've completed your requires, required hours of internship, then you sit for our national um, certifi certification um, exam. And um, back then we had to drive down to South Bend and do a pen and pencil. Um, now you can take it by computer and you know immediately if you pass or fail. So, um, and then after that you are um, a CTRS, so a Certified Therapeutic Recreation Specialist. Um, you'll hear people refer to it as therapeutic recreation still, um, especially in clinical rehab. We tend to hear it more of recreational therapy because it just makes more sense to our patients who are hearing physical therapy, occupational speech therapy, to call it recreational therapy. So, yeah. I appreciate that overview. And did the school help you get your internship? Is that something you had to seek out yourself? Tell us about that kind of nuts and bolts. Yeah, no, the school um, definitely gave us um, recommended placements. Um, we had to seek out the placement as, as far as just the same process that you would apply for a job. So we had to reach out to the facility, say I'm internship, I'm interested in applying for your internship. We had to, um, I had to go down for a number of different interviews um, before I was placed. And I think that was a really important um, part of my education because I was, I was ready to do the job um, search process, just having had to do that, so. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. So Marcus, you know, supply chain is one of those hot majors, you know, more than the MBA I hear, um, um, Master's in Business Administration. So tell us about yeah. the education. Um, this is your chance to do a sales pitch of why people should go into supply chain too. But tell us about your education. <laughs> Um, supply chain is absolutely a hot, uh, uh, it's a big, it's a big job. It's a, it's, it's growing. Um, you think Amazon, you know, all the things that you have shipped to your house or Target or, um, you know, even things like shipped, um, you know, for having your groceries delivered, uh, all of that has to, you know, has to do with logistics, has to do with how you can, um, connect a customer and a customer's needs with someone who can supply those needs, whether it's with products or, you know, getting it from point A to point B. Um, so my, I actually have a, just a master's certification in supply chain management. And what that is, is because I already had a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from um, Grand Valley for health administration, um, Eli Broad College of Business with Michigan State, um, they have a full like four year uh, master's or, uh, or bachelor's degree that you can get in supply chain management. But because I already had a bachelor's degree and I didn't need to retake English and I didn't need to retake all those other prerequisite courses, I could do the master's certification, which gave me all of just those core classes in supply chain management that went over those three specific areas. Um, and also because of my years of experience working with Mary Freebed, as well as previously um, with Employment Group. Uh, you know, I was one of the recruiters um, helping to find, you know, individuals who are looking for temporary staffing or connecting with employers who like, we have a manufacturing surge, we need more staff. I was helping to, you know, connect the people who were looking for the job with the individuals who were looking for employees. Um, so because of that, I was able to just take the master's certification. Um, but all of the interns that intern at Miri Freebed, especially in the last few years, they are going into full four-year master's, I'm sorry, supply chain um, courses. And I'm kind of a little jealous that they get like the full experience. 
Um, but that's definitely um, a great way that uh, we see a lot of schools going. It used to be where just a handful of schools offer it, and now it's pretty widespread. You can get a uh, supply chain from Ferris, Grand Valley, um, Michigan State, of course, but, you know, a bunch of other schools. Um, yeah, so supply chain is uh, it's fun, it's exciting, and the demand is, is certainly growing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I was going to say something else. I just lost my thought on that. Um, oh, about certifications. You know, I think young people need to understand that sometimes it's not adding degree after degree after degree. Like I had my certain level of education and then there were additional certifications that I took to become an expert in the area of my career development. So just be aware that sometimes it's that part of education. It's not always getting an extra degree to take you where you want to go. So I just wanted to pull that out of what you sometimes had to share. Those certifications even mean more than the actual degree itself. If someone is certified, um, you know, Lean Six Sigma, or someone is certified as a certified project manager to get that CMP behind your name, sometimes means more to a company than having MBA. Um, it just depends on the employer that you're looking to, to work for. Um, so project management is another huge one where you can get a bachelor's degree in that, but you can get a certification in it, and that will take you, um, you know, if you want, want to do more of the operational business side. And, um, so, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, thank you so much for getting that out on the table. So, Zach, you're still in school. You're resident. So give us some, uh, some lowdown on, on your education, how someone will get into this. Um. I got my bachelor's in uh, product design development and a lot like physical therapy, you can have a wide variety of degrees, anything. I had um, psychology degrees, a bachelor's degree in my class. I had art uh, major in my class, um, forestry. It's just, you can do anything um, to, uh, get this to uh, the masters in orthotics and prosthetics. Um, orthotics and prosthetics is a pretty small field. Um, there's currently 13 colleges in the US that um, uh, can you can get a master's in orthotics and prosthetics um, at. Um, I got mine at Eastern Michigan University in Ypsilanti. Um, and then before I graduated uh, with in my gra graduate degree, uh, I interviewed with uh, Mary Freebed and got hired. So I had um, I had a job directly out of college, um, entering into my residency um, with orthotics and prosthetics. You have to do a residency, which is pretty much you are being overseen by um, a certified clinician. Um, just to kind of get your feet wet and make sure you um, know what you're know what you're doing, so you don't hurt um, a patient. Because you can um, do the opposite of what you're trying you want to do with some of the devices that we um, use. So you have to do a year of residency per um, pre. Uh, for orthotics and a year of residency for prosthetics because they're they're similar but they're very different in um, some aspects. So um, they want to make sure that you um, really know what you're doing um, in each um, discipline. Um, you have to do the, both, or do people do do the P part or the O part, or do most people do the O and P? Most people do the O and P because. Um, in my opinion, it's fun in, uh, to have a variety um, in your day. So it's never boring. You're seeing something new every day. But you can also get certified in orthotics and certified in prosthetics. Or um, you can, if, you're, if the patient care aspect doesn't um, interest you, you can go into the technical aspect and be a... a orthotic and prosthetic technician, which is the building of the devices, and they specialize in the fabrication side of it. So um, you can go that route as well. And that is a um, certification. Um, I think it's a bachelor's degree, um, but it's his own separate degree. Um, so you can go that route if you want to. And then you, we have to take um, an initial multiple choice board exam 
um, that encompasses both orthotics and prosthetics. And then you have to take two other board exams per discipline um, for kind of the patient care aspect of it. And you, we have to go to Florida for that, to take that exam. So that's really interesting that you have to take, you know, two residencies and for young people that may not know, do you get paid while you're in a residency? Is that yeah. still part of your college education where you're paying them? <laughs> um, so at, at, I think it's Baylor. That's another university that provides this degree. It's part of your education um, to do um, a residency, but through Eastern um, I'm, I'm being paid um, uh at, during residency. And then once we get our certification, um, we get to make more money um, just because well, we've proven ourselves. Sure. More field. credentials. More, yeah, more credentials exactly. for you. Yeah. So again, um, for people on the talking tour, you know, to, to go investigate that, I'm going to give you a, a great website where you can dig into this a little further. Um, we're approaching our first hour. We're going to, you know, get to a few more questions and we'll let everyone go for the evening, but I'd love for each of you to share just what are your favorite things about your work? Maybe a favorite patient story. You know, what, what inspires you every day to go to work? Elizabeth, we'll start with you. I feel like that's a loaded question, but uh, <laughs> David's nodding his head if he agrees. Um, one of my personal favorite things is when I can give someone their first meal that they've had in a few weeks or months or however long that that's been. Um, there are some times where we might get a patient who comes to us from acute care who is not able to, to eat or drink anything and they're, they're being fed through a, a peg tube. Um, so a lot of times I'm going to do like an x-ray of their swallow. We call it a video swallow study to kind of see where their impairment is and, and do some therapy. And yeah, the first meal is a big one. That's a big one for people. Very, very rewarding there. Um, you know, same thing, you know, being able to get someone to say their name for their first time or their kid's name for their, you know, the first time. Um, I love you. Um, trying to set up assistive devices to help them communicate. I mean, ultimately, I feel like you just have to wrap it up in like the patient experience and the patient care. I mean, yeah, I hear you get pretty bonded. Yeah. Experiences every day. Yeah, I, I've heard that about Mary Free Bed staff. You guys get pretty bonded with your, yeah. with your patients yeah. because you're at yeah. these just life-changing times in their lives and the intimate care when you're dealing with someone's like say their voice or their, um, their swallow, that's, that's kind of intimate. Um, you know, contact. Just help. Yeah. Them and we see the patients Monday through Friday. So like you said, I mean, we do establish relationships for sure with patients and their families. And, you know, it's always really exciting when people go home, but it's almost bittersweet too, because you, you know, you, you do create those connections for sure. Yeah. So if you're listening to this, you know, that's something to do kind of a self-assessment, you know, is that because there's different um, careers, right? Some, you just like a dentist office, oh, you develop relationships, but maybe there's some hospital departments where, you know, you just see patients, they come and they go and you never really get to know them. And then there's some situations like this where you get to know them, even mm -hmm. long-term care, right? You have an elderly person that you get to know over time. So that's part of that self-assessment for young people to figure out what kind of fits them. Mm -hmm. um, so David, what about you? What's your favorite things about your job or your, maybe one of your favorite patient stories? Yeah. Um, well, I'd say that um, uh, I totally agree. I've had like tons and tons of patient um, patients that I've like really connected with and um, really like cherished working with. Uh, and I'd say you're in the right profession or you're in the right field or job if you experience those little wins. Um, and what I mean by that is if you've ever like uh, been playing basketball and you know you, you hit a shot, it just feels good. Uh, if you're playing golf and you hit the ball uh, off the tee and it feels real good and it's right down the fairway, it feels really good. And what you want is more of that. Like you, you want more of those little experiences that just felt good. And so in therapy, I would say I've had a lot of experiences where I'm um, meeting a patient and they are struggling with all sorts of different functions. Um, I work with a lot of runners. Um, that's kind of my bread and butter is ru running and uh, triathlon. And, um, and running is what injures most people. So 
um, when I see a runner and I'm able to get them from not running at all to, um, I, I did have a girl um, that I have seen a few times. She's actually become a good friend. Um, uh, she was hardly running. She's running 10, 15 miles a week and then up to a, a marathon that she was hoping to do. So she was able to complete the marathon. So that's one of those little wins where it's like, you know what, like, I did help her get to the point of finishing the race, um, accomplishing her goal. Um, and, it's, and it's all about those um, aspects that keep you going. Yeah, you get to be kind of like the superheroes in people's lives, right? You're the one really helping make that, that change where they can get back to um, yeah. health or, you know, for you, Christy, you know, helping them get back into some fun. So what, maybe what's a story or two that you'd enjoy sharing about why you like your work or a particular patient? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of stories over the 26 years, um, you know, being in inpatient pediatrics, you know, think of you guys, you know, that we're talking to now and imagine in a second, you know, you're in a car accident and you need someone to help you go to the bathroom and someone to help you eat and someone to help you get dressed and you can't get up on your own. And um, you know, the independence that stripped from you um, through that experience, just when you were really gaining a lot of experience and independence um, in your life. And um, so what I loved is, is giving that back, you know, working together with the rehab team and, and giving that back and, and the kids of all ages and adults as well that say, you know, when I'm riding my bike, I feel normal. When I'm swimming in, in the pool, I feel normal. Um, and, you know, when I'm outside, you know, going outside for the first time and people are like, I haven't been outside in three months and just to feel the sun on my face and, you know, be able to garden and watch something grow and, and be a part of something bigger than themselves in their current situation. Um, just that escape that recreation and leisure is for people is, is really, really important. And, um, you know, currently, you know, I work, I worked as inpatient pediatrics, you know, there's you know, some people I saw when they were eight or 10, when they first had their injury, and now I'm seeing them as in adapted sports as adults, you know, they're now, you know, a very good wheelchair basketball player, and they're married, and they have kids, um, they're a really good, you know, rugby player, you know, things like that, and um, it's, it's just really neat to have been such a great part of their life, and to see them be independent, and drive amazing cars, and hold down amazing jobs, and you know, be amazing family, you know, people. And, you know, when I first met them, they thought all of that was, was stripped away. They thought none of that, I'll never be able to have children. Some of the girls would say, you know, as young teenagers and, and now their moms, you know, and things like that. So it's, it's a, it's the everyday wow moments, but it's also the culmination of years and seeing where people go um, when they think that their life is over. Beautiful, beautiful. And I see some questions coming in and we're gonna finish this series about what they love about their work and then we'll make sure we get some of these answers. So Marcus, um, obviously PPE, man, you were, you were the man when that all came down. Um, what else have you, <laughs> what are some of your other stories that you felt like, man, yeah, don't they, they have me? <laughs> sure, we did do such a good job of sourcing PPE that uh, we got a call, um, you know, Mary Freebed CEO is really good. Uh, Kent Riddle, he's good friends with, um, uh, is it Tasha Blackman from um, the CEO of, of Cherry Health? Um, and uh, they were like, we're, we're struggling with PPE. And it was, it was really enlightening to be able to say, yeah, we can donate some of the PPE that we sourced over. Um, you know, I hadn't even thought about that until you, you had to open that. Um, right, PPE, you know? yeah, I'm having nightmares about it. It's the two <laughs> things that really... Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't get to work directly with uh, with patients and with clients. Um, so I, I get my joy um, really from my team. Um, you know, I they'll share stories about, hey, we went to a client's home. You know, the daughter has seen that, um, you know, the, this the, their mother, father, you know, they've just been real depressed. They they feel like they're, they're locked to their lounge chair. Um, and because we went out there, we were able to label and mark their appliances. And, you know, now they can cook again. And we gave them a device where they can read their Bible and balance their checkbook. And, you know, I can walk to my, you know, daughter's house down the block with my, uh, with my, um, with my cane, with my um, you know, guide cane. And so that's real exciting. 
Um, but also when my team, you know, I can see when they're excited and they're like, Marcus, I was able to get this. It came in under budget. It came in early. Um, and just seeing them, you know, get those individual wins too. Um, sometimes it takes um, just looking to see if it's on contract and others it's, you know, it's really a lot of negotiation back and forth with the vendor. Um, so I get it secondhand, but it still puts uh, wind in our sails. Absolutely. And to just have that association with such a great organization that has such a great reputation in town. Um, and like I say, being just part of that team that makes this stuff happen. So Zach, for you, um, I know you're still in training, but you know, what are, what do you already love about it? Obviously you're making a difference just like the OP for, did for you. Yeah. I, I love seeing people take their first steps um, that, in months or years, um, especially with prosthetics. Um, they've had a traumatic um, accident that their leg had to be taken off uh, surgically. And um, it's amazing to see the joy and the emotion come from the patient um, that they're walking on, on something with something, the device, the prosthesis that you made, and um, and with the process is a pretty lengthy process um, to go from casting the patient, which is wrapping them up and getting the model, um, exact model of their limb, um, to the final product of a finished leg. You, it, it could take months to fine tune those things. So it's really a, a team between the patient and a clinician to um, really work together and get accomplished the goals that like walking is people take it for granted. And when that is taken from you, it can be pretty emotional. And to give that ability back to somebody is huge. And that's why I do what I do. I'm inspired. Every time I do a uh, talk and tour with Mary Freebed, I mean, you guys, it's so inspiring how you help people. And um, I know that our talk and tour didn't include a in-person tour, but even when you walk through the hallways, the different art that you have by your patients, um, just the lighting, I don't know. It's just such a place of, I actually had a student tell me when we were touring that this is such a place of hope. And I think that really, it just oozed from you guys when we, we took a group of students one time. So we have a few questions and I did actually pull down a, a video from Mary Freebed's um, great um, group of videos to show what it looks like behind the scenes. So I'm gonna show that before we finish up. But um, Zach, I don't know if you uh, responded to Rachel uh, privately, but she was wondering if Eastern um, felt like a good program. Did you feel prepared when you were done? She's looking probably for some direction there. Yeah, I felt very uh, um, prepared for the field. Um, Eastern, brings in volunteer patients that have had amputations or um, spinal cord injuries um, requiring um, orthotics. So we really get to kind of hone in our patient care um, skills and our technical hand skills and de decisions on what, what is best for the patient. So um, we really got to cover um, all the bases on that. Of course, there's things that they don't prepare you for um, in school. Like it's hard to prepare for an ICU patient, um, uh, intensive intensive care unit um, on a, for a patient that's on a ventilator that needs a neck brace that got in a car accident and they're in a coma. It's hard to prepare students for that. So that's kind of where the residency comes in. Um, but overall, I felt. Eastern was a wonderful program, and I've heard that from um, hiring um, managerial staff that students coming from Eastern are well prepared um, and um, really know, um, have a very good foundation of patient care skills and technical skills. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I'm sure your personal um, recommendation really helps her because with only 13 programs, you know, in the country, you, you want to be mm -hmm. getting the right one. And so Eastern, I believe that's the only one in Michigan. And then Baylor is the other closest one. Uh, there's one at um, Northwestern, which is in okay. Chicago. So okay. that's the next closest one to this area. So right. yeah, your colleague Lance has been on our panels. And I think that's where yeah. he went, right? Yep. He went to Northwestern. 
Um, I know this comes across, uh, has come up before. Um, young people want to know, like, as far as your education, I think I'll have you um, answer this, Elizabeth, because I think it's the same for most of you. As far as specializing in pediatrics, that's not extra education, right? It's part of your education, and then it's really the on-the-job experience that starts to hone in. So go ahead and give some feedback on that, Elizabeth. Yeah, at least for speech and language pathology, I think it's the same for PT and OT, but um, it's not extra schooling for pediatrics. Um, once you get into your master's, um, typically people at least have an idea if they kind of want to go the pediatric route or the adult route. There are, um, you do have to have a certain number of observation hours even before um, your master. So, so hopefully you kind of have an idea at least. Um, at Michigan State, when we were trying to choose our clinical experiences and, and where we wanted to intern, um, we got to give input for that. Um, so you do have to have a, a minimum of one of each adult and pediatric, but you know, your other internships, you can, you can give that, that reference, but really you're going to hone in those specialized skills, you know, really just with experience. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Karis just had a quick question. She would missed it. Um, speech path is undergrad four and then a two for master's, but some schools Correct. have a five. I think Calvin in town has a five-year program where you get the whole kit and caboodle in five years, I believe. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. Yes, they to do. To be honest, well, I'm not I'm sure, sure they about do. Calvin. Yeah. Have, check out Calvin, Karis, because I believe they have a five-year master's program for speech path. But otherwise, yeah, it's four years, then two years. Yeah, right. exactly. Good. Um, so it's um, about 20 to 5, and I, I do want to wrap this up because I um, think we've gotten some really great information out today. Um, I want to give Sh uh, Shamil a chance to kind of give a big picture of Mary Free Bed. Um, obviously, anyone who's been on this um, Zoom realizes what a great place it is to work, but there's just a few details. I'm going to show a video. Um, I'm going to give my email at the end um, for anyone who's on the call. So if you have follow-up questions with any of these um, role models, you know, shoot it to me and I'll make sure they get it so they can um, answer that. So please know that um, we're going to help you get some things that if you didn't get answered in this first hour that we'll, we can get to those answers. And so I want to thank you guys. Um, I, before I let you go, because we're going to do this extra part, but what's a little word of wisdom as we um, talk to these young people as they kind of explore careers? And Zach, we'll start with you and work our way backwards. So Zach, what kind of word of wisdom do you want to give? Um. Hmm, that's a tough question. Um, uh, you really want to find find yourself and find what kind of person you are. Are, are you um, a person that wants to work with people or are you more of a hands-on person or a little bit of both like myself? So um, explore different options. Um, volunteer. Um, find out what what makes you click and happy. So if you're, if you're happy doing whatever you want, you're really not working. I don't feel like I go to work every day. I just, I love what I do. So that's a beautiful I thing. And I second that I, I would do my work too, if I didn't get paid for it. That's, that's great advice. How about you, Marcus? Kind of word of wisdom. Man, Zach, you, you, you took it. Um, <laughs> that's exactly it. You know, find something that you enjoy. Um, you know, and you know, for me, the constant that's remained is that, uh, I find joy in helping other people. Um, it might not be clinically, but it's just how can we help, you know, identify the solution to a need or to a problem. Um, so as many opportunities as you, um, you know, never say no to an opportunity, uh, you know, as many internships or job shadows um, and never stop learning. Yeah, keep coming to these talking tours and we have a career chats where we deal one-on-one -on -one with um, professionals. So those are really great things that we offer and I'll give the website for that. Um, thanks, Marcus. Christy, word of wisdom. Yeah, I would I would say uh, Zach also did an excellent job. Um, had a lot of things I would say as well. Um, you know, just keep working hard. Um, you know, get volunteer experience in lots of different areas. You know, we're always looking for volunteers. So if you want to come out and you know work the table at a tournament or help with a practice or help do a, a you know transfers with a you know a class or a clinic that we've got going on. Um, you know, that hands-on, that resume building, that confidence you gain, um, you're going to have more unique answers in an interview situation. If you can talk, you know, about an opportunity you've had volunteering, um, get those extra certifications. Um, you know, I, 
when I was going through, you know, my life, even before college, um, I got my water safety instructor certification. I got my CPR certification. I got my lifeguarding certification. I got them all at once. And that really helped, you know, working at the camps where I worked, where I was white waterfront director and things like that, but it also brought my resume to the top, you know, with all that pool experience and all the pool therapy work that we do as recreational therapists here at Mary Freebed. So um, you just never know when that one certification is gonna have your resume stand out um, and your hard work ethic and your ability to just jump in and do whatever needs to be done at an event or you know, you know, whatever volunteer experience you pick, um, it's a small community and people will talk and you'll get that job interview over someone else who doesn't have that experience. So good gold. luck to you guys. Yeah, that's gold, gold information, yeah. people. This is this is good stuff. Um, that's just awesome. David? Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> Another taking uh, all the good words. <laughs> yep, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. I, you know, I would honestly say that um, I've always um, tried to um, start down a path that offers me uh, a lot of options. And that way then I can explore those options and kind of pick like, okay, I really, really like this. I think I want to go this way. But I've also been in, a, in the exact situation of like, oh, I didn't think I would like this other option so much. And, and I almost leaned that way because I experienced it and then enjoyed it so much that you know, it, it really made you reflect on uh, what what you truly want to do and what's going to um, help fulfill your your career path. Um, and then also, yeah, like working hard and there's going to be um, aspects of every single job that uh, out there that is difficult or that we don't like, like we don't all like paperwork. <laughs> you know, and, and getting getting down all the details, that's that's kind of a, a, a tough aspect of uh, most jobs, most healthcare jobs. And, you know, um, persevere through that um, because it's a small part really. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say a small part, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a hurdle you get through because you enjoy the outcomes that you have with your patients. Yeah, that's good stuff, David. And I, and I love the, I, I feel like sometimes young people get in, themselves into really niche undergrads where they don't have a lot of flexibility. So I love that piece of advice to just keep it a little general. You've heard from all these majors, all these uh, masters where you can do, really have some flexibility in the undergrad. So yeah, don't don't get yourselves in such a niche young people because you just really don't know what you don't know yet. Um, so be open to exploring. And um, last but not least, Lizbeth, what kind of word of wisdom? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely what everyone else said, I, I would agree with all of that. Um, I, I think it's okay to not know exactly what you want to do right away. Um, like Dave said, keeping an open mind so you have options open. Um, another tip I would give is, you know, in addition to volunteering, you know, even reaching out to like your parents' friends or if you have older siblings' friends, you probably know someone who works in a medical field of some sort, you know, just, just really take advantage of those connections. You know, most of the job observation hours are going to be needed at some point anyways, you know, and if you're doing them, I would jot them down. <laughs> you might as well now um, if you're doing that. Um, the other tip I would really give is ask a lot of questions. Um, I, it's okay to not know things. And I think it actually reflects better on you when you're engaged, um, wanting to learn more. I mean, I think that's something that I really value working about here is I want to continue learning. If I don't know something, then I want to go research it or talk to my colleagues. So um, I think just, you know, asking questions is, is a really good way to just show that, that you're engaged and, and you're interested and, and you want to learn. Yeah, that's gold, you guys. And so thank you so much for being here and sharing your time. I do want to introduce Jamil Nack. She's been my go-to person. Um, and I love that some of you have got to hear each other's stories you haven't met in person, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And so now you have some more understanding of the passion of your colleagues. Um, so Jamil, your turn, but maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the things um, for students to make some, you know, having job shadows or what kind of internships you guys have. So why don't you give us a big picture of um, Mary Freebed and maybe some things that haven't been shared if there was anything. I know we, we did a pretty good job of kind of right. letting people know, but any tidbits that you might want to add to it. I'm sorry I missed your opportunity. To begin no, it's okay. <laughs> Everyone covered everything I would have covered for the most part. Um, so I'm the HR coordinator and um, I work 
pretty closely with our job shadow programs. So as a few people um, mentioned, job shadows are a great way to kind of see, is this something that I'm interested in or would like to learn more about? So at the moment, we kind of have our job shadows on pause, but I would be one of the person or I would be the person that you're going to connect with um, to try to get on maybe a wait list so that I can keep you updated on when job shadows are going to be available. Um, we are also trying to expand those a little bit more to our offsite locations where maybe some of the social distancing restrictions aren't quite as um, aren't so pressing because there already aren't that many people there on the main campus there are a lot of people so it's a it's a lot harder to get extra bodies in certain places where on some of our off-site locations that may be more of an option um, also our volunteer program we do for uh, I think Elizabeth was mentioning the observation hours and, and I think Dave might have mentioned the observation hours that are needed to go into these grad programs uh, so for students who actually no, this is the route that I want to take and I'm planning on applying to a grad program, you can also reach out to us. That program is going on right now and we are still recruiting for different semesters. So you can definitely get started on that. And like Elizabeth mentioned, with those observation hours, you might can see, okay, this is the area that I'm more interested in or, um, you know, maybe I want to learn a little bit more about that. And then also internships. So because I work in human resources, um, I kind of am helping to streamline. We have clinical internships, we have administrative internships and everything in between and on the sides. Uh, so I can be your connector for those. And just in general, I love to help people kind of find their path. So if you ever have questions, if it's just, should I do an OT job shadow or PT job shadow, you know, maybe I can find a way to connect you with um, maybe a Maybe you do half and half, um, or maybe you just have a few questions and maybe just I can connect you to someone to talk to so you can make that determination. So please reach out to me if you're interested in Mary Freebed and these learning opportunities that we do have. And just to, just for clarification, um, a lot of the observation hours, those are for college kids, right? I, I just want to clarify that as far as high school students, um, the for high school tours, students, the talking the, tours the, are- yep. These are going to be um, a great thing for you to do, but then also for high school students, they do have the option. As I said, it's postponed, but you do have the option of doing job shadows. Um, when social uh, distancing is, is, a, is, I don't know when the world will return to normal or when we'll um, have some ease of restriction, but I typically will do student tours of the hospital just so you can get an overview of the layout and the different departments. Um, but high school students are eligible for job shadows as long as you're at least 16 years of age. And then again, that college student volunteers program where you're gonna get those continuous observation hours, that is for students who have declared, a, you know, they are, uh, have been accepted into a grad program or know that's the route that they're gonna take. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, you guys have all been great. This has um, just been gold information for young people. And again, know that you're really impacting young people by giving your own personal experiences. Um, Shamila, I'm going to end up giving people my email at the end for anyone that has questions for any of you. And so um, know if you're still on the call that I'll help facilitate that. Um, for you panelists, um, you're welcome to leave. Anyone who wants to see this awesome video, please stay on. I'm going to share a really great video that gives some behind the scenes look at what Mary Freebed is all about. Um, so again, leave if you need to, panelists, but thank you, thank you for being here. I so appreciate it. So let me share my screen, um, and then I will give my contact information for anyone who needs that. I think I'm going to go.
I drive 216 miles, you know, to get here. That's how much I trust her. I'm back driving and back to work and now I'm halfway running. Instantly when I got here, even the welcome was like a lean towards, okay, now it's time to start pushing. Um, whatever you want to be, you can be it. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. Mary Freebed has kind of restored the fact that that's true. A program that saved my life, I would recommend to anyone. I love that little video because it was really able to give us um, just some pictures of what you guys have been talking about, right? Some of that equipment and um, just how you guys do your work. So I hope that's been really helpful to everybody. Um, I do have one more thing for, I'm sorry, I should have shared this out here. Um, a website that if you want the nitty gritty of these careers, um, well, first roadtripnation.com is a wonderful website. It actually has lots of little videos, just like we've done today of people in their careers. And so if you go to roadtripnation.com and hover over career exploration, um, click interest and there's 29 different categories and there's 52 mentors just in medicine. So if you are exploring, I highly recommend Road Trip Nation. For the nuts and bolts, onetonline.org. That's onetonline.org is a great site. It has every job you can imagine. Um, it's from the federal government. So all sorts of statistics and information about careers um, connected to other resources, like these um, different associations, you know, physical therapy association, all those kind of resources are connected to this particular website. So onetonline.org. Um, and this is just a quick snapshot of what you would see if you went to that website, just for recreational therapists alone. It gives information about the different titles that they might also go, go under. And then information about, you know, what kind of skills you need, what kind of abilities, what kind of wages. Um, what kind of credentials, what kind of interests. So I love this website. Uh, again, onetonline.org. So you can do some further research. So I'm hoping this conversation today has really motivated you to keep um, learning and figuring out some next steps for your career path. And then that was the video. So, so thank you, everybody. It was so nice meeting you.